Um, I, I've had the pleasure of interviewing some of our science fiction writers that we are connected to, and the ones who are particularly uh, oriented to the science of science fiction. Not surprisingly, I'm a big Neil Stevenson fan, and any of you read Seven Eves, the sections on orbital mechanics were just poetic as far as I was concerned. <laughs> uh, I'm an astronautical engineer, so it's the kind of stuff I love. Uh, uh, I had the chance to interview Andy Weir here about going to Mars. Uh, and uh, the real interest in modern Mars actually did begin with Andy Weir. He's a parvenu. He's recent. The real modern interest in Mars, of course, we all know, began with red Mars, blue Mars, and green Mars. In fact, uh, when my son, who's now 26 years old, was just not quite five, that was the first science fiction he encountered. I actually read it to him over the course of a summer, all of Red Mars uh, through it. And he is now a writer because of it. <laughs> so Stan actually led to what my son has become. I have a great admiration for it. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is talk about science. We're going to talk about the science behind this new book, all about climate change. And you're going to learn why the robot map here has drawn us New York City and Antarctica. What's the connection between the two? Stan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Michael, for this series and everybody for coming. And last year, I talked about this book whilst I was uh, still writing it. and and talked about the kind of what you might call the financial plot and uh, was invited to come back to talk about the uh, climate part of things. So my notion here is to read for uh, uh, a section and then kind of unpack that same section so that you can see how the science and science fiction kind of works and also um, um, learn more about how um, my my ass was saved by James Hansen um, <laughs> because I wanted, um, you know, I wanted New York to be looking like that and so I could have what I called the super Venice in the book. And so this was uh, driven, my notion of sea level rise was driven simply by how much sea level rise I needed to flood lower Manhattan. <laughs> and the topographical map showed me that it was about 50 feet. And that's a lot. That's an awful lot. So I will read to you a bit and then describe to you how James Hansen came to my rescue. The first pulse was not ignored by an entire generation of ounce brains. That is a myth. Although like most myths, it has some truth to it, which has since been exaggerated. The truth is that the first pulse was a profound shock. As how could it not be, raising sea level by 10 feet in 10 years? That was already enough to disrupt coastlines everywhere, also to grossly inconvenience all the major shipping ports around the world, and shipping is trade. Those containers and their millions had been circulating by way of diesel-burning ships and trucks, moving around all the stuff people wanted, produced on one continent and consumed on another, following the highest rate of return, which is the only rule that people observed at that time. So that very disregard for the consequences of their carbon burn had unleashed the ice that caused the rise of sea level that wrecked the global distribution system and caused a depression that was even more damaging to the people of that generation than the accompanying refugee crisis, which, using the unit popular at the time, was rated at 50 Katrinas. Pretty bad, but the profound interruption of world trade was even worse as far as business was concerned. So, yes, the first pulse was a first-order catastrophe, and it got people's attention, and changes were made, sure. People stopped burning carbon much faster than they thought they could before the first pulse. They closed that barn door the very second the horses had gotten out. <laughs> the four horses, to be exact. Too late, of course. The global warming initiated before the first pulse was baked in by then and could not be stopped by anything that the post-pulse people could do. So despite changing everything and decarbonizing as fast as they should have 50 years earlier, they were still cooked like bugs on a griddle. Even tossing a few billion tons of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere to mimic a volcanic eruption and thus deflect a fair bit of sunlight, depressing temperatures for a decade or two, which they did in the 2060s to great fanfare and or gnashing of teeth, was not enough to halt the warming because the relevant heat was already deep in the oceans and it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon no matter how people played with the global thermostat, imagining that they had godlike powers. They didn't. So, 
It was that ocean heat that caused the first pulse to pulse and later brought on the second one. People sometimes say no one saw it coming, but no, wrong, they did. Paleoclimatologists looked at the modern situation and saw CO2 levels screaming up from 280 to 450 parts per million in less than 300 years, faster than it ever happened in the Earth's entire previous 5 billion years. Can we say Anthropocene, class? And they searched the geological record for the best analogs to this unprecedented event, and they said, whoa. They said, holy shit. People, they said, sea level rise. During the Eemian period, they said, which we've been looking at, the world saw a temperature rise only half as big as the one we've just created, and rapid dramatic sea level rise followed immediately. They put it in bumper sticker terms. Massive sea level rise sure to follow our unprecedented release of CO2. They published their papers and shouted and waved their arms, and a few canny and deeply thoughtful sci-fi writers wrote up lurid accounts of such an eventuality. <laughs> And the rest of civilization went on torching the planet like a Burning Man pyro masterpiece. Really. That's how much those knuckleheads cared about their grandchildren, and that's how much they believed their scientists, even though every time they felt a slight cold coming on, they ran to the nearest scientist, i.e. doctor, to seek aid. So, the people of the 2060s staggered on through the Great Depression that followed the first pulse, and of course there was a crowd in that generation, a certain particular 1% of the population, that just by chance wrote things out rather well and considered that it was really an act of creative destruction, as was everything bad that didn't touch them. And all people needed to do to deal with it was to buckle down in their traces and accept the idea of austerity, meaning more poverty for the poor, and accept the police state with lots of free speech and freaky lifestyles, velvet glove in the iron fist, and hey presto, on we go with the show. Humans are so tough. But pause ever so slightly, and those of you anxious to get back to the narrating of the antics of individual humans can skip to the next chapter and know that any more expository rants, any more info dumps on your carpet from this New Yorker will be printed in red ink to warn you to skip them. Pause, broader-minded, more intellectually flexible readers to consider why the first pulse happened in the first place. Any Antarctic ice that slides into the ocean floats away, leaving more for more to slide. And in the 21st century, as during the three million years before that, a lot of Antarctic ice was piled up on basin slopes, meaning giant valleys, which angled down into the ocean. Ice slides downhill, just like water, only slower, although if sliding, skimboarding, on a layer of liquid water, not that much slower. So all the ice hanging over the edge of the ocean was perched there and not sliding very fast because there were buttresses of ice right at the waterline or just below it that were basically stuck in place. This ice at the shoreline lay directly on the ground, stuck there by its own massive weight, thus forming, in effect, long drams ringing all of Antarctica, dams that somewhat held in place the big basins of ice uphill from them. But these ice buttresses at the ocean ends of these very huge ice basins were mainly held in place by their leading edges, which are grounded underwater, slightly offshore still held to the ground by their own massive weight, but caught underwater on rock shelves offshore that rose up like the low edges of a bowl, the result of earlier ice action in previous epochs. These outermost edges of the ice dams were called by scientists the buttress of the buttress. Don't you love that phrase? So, yeah, the buttresses of the buttresses were there in place, but as the phrase might suggest to you, they were not huge in comparison to the masses of ice they were holding back, nor were they well emplaced. They were just lying there in the shallows of Antarctica, that continent-sized cake of ice, that cake of ice 10,000 feet thick and 1,500 miles in diameter. Do the math on that, O oh, numerate ones among you, and for the rest, 230-foot sea level rise is the answer given earlier. And lastly, those rapidly warming circumpolar ocean currents already mentioned were circulating mainly about a kilometer or two down, meaning, you guessed it, right at the level where the buttresses of the buttresses were resting. And ice, though it sits on land, and even on land bottoming shallow water weren't heavy enough, floats on water when water gets under it. As is well known, consult your cocktail for confirmation of this phenomenon. <laughs> so, the first pulse was mostly the Wilkes Victoria Basin, also Greenland, also West Antarctica, another less massive but consequential contributor, as its basins lay almost entirely below sea level, such that they were quick to break their buttresses and then float up on the subtruding ocean water and sail away. All this ice breaking up and sailing into the seas. Years of greatest rise, 2052 to 2061, and suddenly the ocean was 10 feet higher. Oh no, how could it be? Rates of change themselves change. That's how. 
Say the speed of melting doubles every 10 years. How many decades before you are fucked? Not many. <laughs> it resembles compound interest. Or recall the old story of the great Mughal emperor who was talked into repaying a peasant who had saved his life by giving the peasant one grain of rice and then two and doubling that again on every square of a chessboard. Possibly the grand vizier or chief astronomer advised this payment or the canny peasant and the unquant emperor said, sure, good deal, rice grains, who cares? And started to dribble out the payment having been well trained in counting rice grains by a certain passing Serbian dervish woman. A couple few rows into the chessboard, he sees how he's been had and has the vizier or astronomer or peasant beheaded, maybe all three, that would be imperial style. <laughs> the 1% get nasty when their assets are threatened. So that's how it happened with the first pulse. Big surprise. What about the second pulse, you ask? Don't ask. It was just more of the same. Doubled as everything loosened in the increasing warmth in the higher seas. Mainly, the Aurora Basin's buttress let loose and its ice flowed down the Totten Glacier. The Aurora was a basin even bigger than the Wilkes Victoria. And then, with sea level raised 15 feet, then 20 feet, all of the buttresses of the buttresses lost their footing all the way around Antarctic continent after which said buttresses were shoved from behind into the sea, after which gravity had its way with the ice and all the basins all around East Antarctica and the ice resting on ground below sea level in West Antarctica. And all that ice quickly melted when it hit water, and even when it was still ice and floating, often in the form of tabular bergs the size of major nations, it was already displacing the ocean by as much as it would when it finished melting. Why that should be is left as an exercise for the reader to solve, after which you can run naked from your leaky bath crying, Eureka. But hey, an end is a beginning. Creative destruction, right? Apply more police state and more austerity, clamp down hard, proceed as before. Cleaning up the mess, a great investment opportunity. Churn, baby, churn. And the citizen, who is the voice that you're hearing there, goes on at some length, but I'll stop at that point. <laughs> and thank you. I just read a review of this yesterday that said, by my good friend John Clute, the encyclopedist of science fiction, who said that the citizen is obviously KSR unbound at last. The, <laughs> the radioactive heart of info dumps, I believe he called him. So um, I'm proud of that. And so, okay, I wanted 50 foot sea level rise by 2140, whatever. I needed it as soon as possible because I wanted to talk about the, the financial crash of 2008 and how we could do better next time. So on the one hand, I wanted it to be as soon as possible in the future as possible. On the other hand, I wanted 50 foot sea level rise. The IPCC at this point is saying that by the end of this century, sea level rise will max out at like um, one meter. So I had a discrepancy there and lo and behold, James Hansen et al, um, 18 co-authors, 2016 paper while I was actually in the midst of writing this book, but obviously not the passage I just read to you, which comes after the paper involved, because what the, this rant does is pretty much give you the results of this Hansen paper. What Hansen and his colleagues wanted to say to the world is the IPCC, in attempting to be conservative, in attempting to say only something that they can back up, needed to give a quite small figure for potential sea level rise in the next uh, 100 years. And of course, history isn't going to stop in 100 years. But in any case, it's a conservative estimate. And indeed, you know, as far as we can tell, in the last 100 years, you can measure sea level rise in millimeters. So it isn't as if anything has happened yet. I believe I, just this afternoon, reading in Discover Magazine, said that between 1850 and now, sea level has risen about a foot. So when you're talking about um, 50 feet, you needed something, and here's Hansen. The economic and social cost of losing functionality of all coastal cities is practically uncalculable. Adaptation will not work. So what he says in this paper with his 19 colleagues is actually a very strange case. It's cobbled together like a house of cards, and indeed if you pull out any card, the total house kind of falls to the ground. And so it's rickety and it has been criticized, and Hansen, of course, now is a political figure. He's not just a scientist, the NASA scientist did all this great work. He's also the guy that laid down in front of uh, uh, tranks in order to get arrested, in order to protest coal, coal trains, I believe, was what he laid down in front of. So when he writes a paper and says, look, we've completely underestimated the rapidity of sea level rise, 
the suspicion of this paper was extreme, and the paper is rickety. I would be very interested to hear an analysis by a real scientist, because uh, along the way, Hansen will say, well, if, thing, if the doubling rate of sea level rise goes every 10 years, you've got a certain rate. If it's 20 years, you've got another rate. If, you, if you've got uh, every 40 years, you've got another rate. Well, anybody can say that, and it's true, but there's no evidence as to which rate we're on, because we're at the part of the graph where things are just moving horizontally, and how the jump will happen is, is uh, unknown to us right now. So he's doing an act of science fiction in nonfiction form, and that can be challenged as such. <laughs> That in fact, there's many uh, work of science fiction in nonfiction form. It's a genre. Um, <laughs> so he had to go back to the Emian. As my narrator says, the Emian is about 130 to 120,000 years ago. It's the last big interglacial. During that time, he says, temperatures only went up about one degree Celsius. In other words, what we've already done now. We've already done this since the Industrial Revolution. And sea level seems to have gone up within a century about 10 meters, maybe more. And so for me, with my need and for my story's purposes, I read this paper and I'm going, wow, this is like a gift from God. I've got justification for what I'm doing here. And this is a little perverse. And there are other people a little more concerned about rapid, massive sea level rise than I was when I was reading this paper and loving it for how it was helping me in my book. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, 125,000 years ago, finding where sea level was is a really tough problem in paleogeology because of lithostatic rebound. Ice weighs down the lithosphere, then the ice goes away, the lithosphere rebounds. There was a sea level rise there, but was that, our, was that land there when the sea level rise was there or not? So these things have to be correlated, and the evidence that Hansen and his team had for where sea level was and how fast it rose were both about as tenuous as scientific evidence gets. Um, a lot of it comes from the Bahamas and Bermuda, and there are two different ways that they're estimating sea level at the time of 125,000 years ago. Uh, coral reefs, how high can they be? But of course, coral reefs can be two feet underwater or right at the tide line, or they can be 15 feet underwater, so that's another bit of guesswork. And then the kind of uh, carbonate, the platform that is the Bahamas is quickly established by uh, microorganisms that die, go down there, cement really fast, and turn into blocks that then had to have been very, very near sea level at the time that they were formed. And so these are the two best um, ways of estimating where sea level was, and you still have to take into account lithostatic rebound or not. So then there were also findings in Bermuda, the Mediterranean, Papua New Guinea, South Carolina, and West Australia. And so these places are also uh, evidence in, brought into place for what was sea level uh, back then and how fast did it rise. And then Hansen complicates his case in this very same paper by saying, not only do we see that the Emian had very rapid sea level rise with only a small temperature rise, but also there were superstorms as a result. And this has to do with a larger case he's making that the driver of world climate is the Southern Ocean going around Antarctica. What it does drives everything else, they claim. And it used to be the Atlantic or the gigantic ocean current that goes from the Pacific into the Indian, into the Atlantic, all the way up the Atlantic, sinks to the bottom between Greenland and Norway, and goes down the other direction. Any single water molecule takes about 1,000 years to make this circuit. And that was said to be the great world climate driver um, uh, in terms of Earth systems. But now Hansen and his team is claiming that it's the Southern Ocean going around Antarctica, and also saying that um, when things change, like they're changing now, a slight rise in temperature, you get super storms in the Atlantic. And their evidence is these gigantic boulders, a thousand ton boulders that are 40 feet above sea level in Bermuda. And it seems like there's nothing that could have put them there except for really big waves. And I'm thinking thousand tons, 40 feet higher, that's really big waves. But there's no other mechanism to get them there. At least Hansen and his team of colleagues claim that. So this is a little well, how are you going to say that 125,000 years ago there were hurricanes that were five times the size of current hurricanes? Uh, you know, the w weathermen are wrong, climatologists are wrong, and here we have a claim about the strength of storms, except for evidence like this, um, these 
these boulders sitting up high on Bermuda, there isn't a real strong case to be made there. So you have a pretty um, funky case that Hansen and his team has made. And what I think he's doing is yet again waving the, the red flag of danger and trying, and he's not worried about the weakness of the case scientifically. He's not worried about, I mean, this was a peer reviewed paper, but God knows what the peer reviewers said. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I live with a chemist, and I'm just amazed at some of the stuff that, peer, uh, that chemists will say, that peer reviewers will say. And I will say this. This paper is controversial for a reason. But um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has agreed that we need to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius, and Hansen is saying that does not provide us with safety. That's not good enough. He's saying there is a real danger that we will hand young people and future generations a climate system that is practically out of their control. He said, we have a global emergency and fossil fuel CO2 emissions should be reduced as rapidly as practical. Well, this is like back to science speak, as rapidly as practical. I mean, this is suddenly this conservative last sentence. He, he didn't dare to say, we need to reduce it now. We need to reduce it as rapidly as possible. It's as rapidly as practical. It's as if he took a step back at the edge of the cliff before throwing himself into the world of politics. Now, briefly, I want to talk about another paper that came up about the same time. This sea level rise, it seems like it's going to happen to one degree or another. And I would say, as an English major who reads scientific papers with great interest but no expertise whatsoever, um, except as a citizen scientist you know, who's been reading science news for 35 years, that we just don't know right now. Uh, how much sea level rise, how fast, who the hell knows. You can, you can make a scenario, and scenario building is something that Peter doesn't can talk about. You cannot say for sure. But what if we do get sea level rise, and it seems like we're going to get it to some degree or another? Could we do this cool thing, which is mentioned and described in detail in my book, Green Earth, as a stupid um, geoengineering idea, because I wrote it 10 years ago, and I, was, I thought it was a joke, but the Potsdam Institute, a very serious scientific think tank in Germany, has actually uh, done a study of this very same idea. Could we pump seawater back up to the top of the Antarctic Plateau? It freezes there. It's very, very cold there. And then, lo and behold, sea level rise is solved. You just, the ice that's flowing into the sea that's causing sea level rise, you pump it back up to the top, and then, you know, what if you have to do it forever? So what? We're already managing this planet. We are already accidental, uh, and managing isn't the right word because managing would imply we know what we're doing and we're good at it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're finessing, we're begging, we're, we're, we're begging this planet to cooperate with us so that we can stay alive on it, and we're finessing it, we're trying things out, especially ideas. So the Potsdam Institute says, um, the headline is this, for, for their abstract, sea level rise, too big to be pumped away. And I'm thinking, how do they know? Let's, let's examine this a little more carefully. The weight of ice pumped onto the ice cap would speed the push of ice into the sea at the coast. And I've been to Antarctica and I'm saying, no way, that's not a problem. You pump it to the middle of Antarctica and it's gonna be a long time before it pushes the coast. Believe me, it's, it's as big as the United States and, um, and Mexico combined. It's, and, and it's 10,000 feet thick of ice and the coasts are out there. If you pump it up to about the middle of the word Antarctica, well, the Potsdam Institute says it would stay for about 1,000 years. I'm thinking, 1,000 years is good enough. They'll figure out something, <laughs> or we'll just do it forever. <laughs> so then they, how much power, how much electricity to pump that up? When I wrote Green Mars, I thought, well, you just make a bunch of wind turbines. You make a bunch of solar collectors. It has to be clean power. If you burn carbon to do this, you're just doubling your profit. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, digging a hole to bury yourself. So with clean power, how much power would you need? They estimate it would require one-tenth of the present annual global energy supply. Whoa. I was, I guess I would have guessed a hundred, uh, one hundredth of that or one-tenth. But I'm just guessing and I'm an English major. It was just a, a thought. You know, water, you pump it uphill. How bad could it be? But it's a lot of water and it's 10,000 vertical feet. And so I trust their figures. They're German scientists. I'm sure they got that right. So then how many wind turbines is that, given current wind turbines? That's, 
why they put it this way. I think it's so funny. 850,000 wind turbines. Whoa. It's a lot of wind turbines. Why not just call it a million wind turbines, you know? Rounding error. I mean, just make it simple. You need a million wind turbines to power the moving of sea level, uh, of, you know, of seawater back up to the Antarctic cap. Well, I think they may be talking about doing that. It would be cheaper than what's going to happen if there is 10 to 50 feet of sea level rise. Because the coastal areas of the world are shipping and trade, as my uh, citizen said. It's also a lot of agriculture, aquaculture. It's about a tenth of the world's population. It, and in terms of the uh, monetary value of the infrastructure, the built infrastructure, I calculate a, a gazillion barillion dollars. This is, <laughs> and uh, my insurance guy at Swiss Re, I asked him, you know, could you, am I right about that? And he's going, yeah, so he's this Swiss friend. He goes, don't even try to calculate that one. That one is indeed is like, why not just call it infinity? So a million wind turbines, what if they were made of plastic? What if you had a, a 3D printer? What if you had robots printing them? What if, you had, what if you wanted to do it bad enough? What if it became part of a saving civilization? Well, we might end up doing it. The potential, if all of Antarctica uh, melts, as, as I guess the citizen pointed out, is about 230 feet of sea level rise. That would mean that we would be like 200 feet underwater here, or maybe 220 feet underwater right here. And there are some good maps of San Francisco with the full 230 feet rise. Um, they're crazy, because that, that is not likely to happen, uh, because the cake in Antarctica, with the being at the poles, being very, very cold in the winter, um, we can be confident it won't be the 230 feet. But it might be a lot. And before I finish, and yes, I'm on time, um, the 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 reason these estimates have changed is this the Totten Glacier and the Wilk Glacier, these are really big basins that are, the, if the ice in them is allowed to slide out, uh, one of them is three to four meters of sea level rise all by itself. Uh, the other one is five to six meters of sea level rise all by itself. And Greenland is, is um, um, four to six uh, meters of sea level rise all by itself. Uh, Greenland's different from Antarctica because it's in a bathtub of, uh, of, of rock with only a few breaks in the bathtub of rock. That's why I talked about the leaky bathtub that um, Archimedes leaps out of. Um, you've got this uh, issue where Antarctica has um, deep valleys that are as big as the Grand Canyon and two or three kilometers below sea level ready to um, get warm and slide all that ice off into the sea. So. Probably the IPCC is wrong. Probably Hansen, to one degree or another, is right. A warning flag got put up in the middle of 2016. And as Gavin Newsom said when they informed him at a recent meeting that California might see a seven foot sea level rise in seven to 10 foot like in the next century and that sea level rise is worse in California than the rest of the world because we're such a special state in so many ways. Um, he said, well, what am I supposed to do with that? What are we supposed to do with that? And he says, well, it's a good question. What are we supposed to do with that? Um, big problems. I lastly just want to thank Otto, the automatic drawer, for this incredible map of New York. And maybe there's one more point, since I do have three minutes left. Um, I went to a meeting in, uh, at Trinity Church on Wall Street, right next to where George Washington was made president and where one of the Trump Towers is. It was, it's a very weird place. Uh, and there we talked about sea level rise, and I read the chapter about how the beavers were going to take over Manhattan. And the next panel to get up to speak, one guy was very all right. He said, I don't want to give Manhattan back to the beavers, which I thought was, a, you know, a motto. It should be a T-shirt. <laughs> I personally think Manhattan would be way better off with the beavers, and that's kind of what my novel is about, um, you know, the coming back of the animals. But what they were about in that panel was, Storm surge protection for Manhattan. They rejected my thesis entirely, which is happening a lot when I was in New York, I noticed. And between Sandy Hook and the Rockaway Breezy Point on Long Island, they proposed, it's shallow, they proposed to build a barrier there with an in and out for ships, and, a, and they can close it off during storm surges. I got up afterwards and I said, well, what about Long Island Sound? You gonna put another uh, barrier at Hellgate? He goes, no, we're gonna put it at Frog's Neck. So I guess that's a little further out there. And then I said, but wait a second, the Hudson is like 300,000 cubic feet per second, even normally. It's not 
a lagoon like Venice because they're thinking Venice because the Lido is now blocked off in Venice. And the Adriatic can be up to 20 to 30 feet higher than the lagoon and Venice will not get drowned anymore. And that's what these people in New York are thinking. But meanwhile, the Hudson is pouring down in there. And it's gonna, so I said, this is not, a, this is not a, pro a solution to the problem of sea level rise. No, he said, it's a storm surge barrier. I'm thinking, OK, but you're, you're going to spend billions for a storm surge barrier while sea level is rising to the point where you would never be able to open the gates, and then the Hudson would flood you. So current plans, and with that, I'm on time and can quit. Current plans for what to do for New York? No way. You'd be better off trying to put the wa seawater back on top of uh, Antarctica, which is also, of course, crazy. And so it's worth talking. When Peter gets up here, maybe we'll talk about geoengineering, about what we can do. The obvious thing is decarbonization as fast as possible. That's, but that's always been the obvious thing. And now, since we're not doing that very well, we, we begin to talk about geoengineering in a most serious way. So that's what we've really been talking about here. Well, now, Peter, come on up, and we'll go on from there. Great. That was great, Stan. Uh, so what I suggest, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit, and then we'll throw it open for comments, questions, discussion from the, the rest of you. Uh, I want to begin a little bit with the climate change discussion. I want to talk a little bit about geoengineering, and I also want to talk a little bit about the book itself. Sure. It's a hell of a good book, right? I mean, you know, yeah, it's great science and all that, but it's also a good book. And I want, because the book is different from some of the other books, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But let's talk about the science, because uh, it, you, you raised some of the questions about Jim Hansen's paper, uh, and uh, I'm a Jim Hansen fan like you. Uh, and my first uh, uh, effort to deal with climate change actually goes back to 1977 when I was at Stanford Research Institute and we did one of the first global climate assessments. And my background is actually fluid mechanics. I'm actually a rocket scientist by education. The only virtue of my degree is I actually get to say that, that I am a rocket scientist. But I did the fluid mechanics of the model. And the conclusion we came to was that the world was looking at a period of fairly dynamic climate, not just a gradually warming climate, but rapid swings around an average that might be rising in terms of temperature. Uh, in 2004, Stuart Brand and I wrote a paper for the Pentagon on abrupt climate change that was built on the idea of uh, a recurrence of an event which occurred 8,200 years ago in which uh, the climate of the northern hemisphere cooled rather dramatically for 10 years, stayed cold and dry for a century, and then came back up again. We did that because we didn't want to try and model the future. We said, look, this actually happened. It could happen again. And so I was looking at what the implications of that were. And I think more and more the evidence suggests that I think the model you presented, whether it is the particulars of the, the berms in Antarctica and the particular flows, almost doesn't matter. That there are a number of different mechanisms by which abrupt change can happen, where very rapid change can happen. The one you've described is one plausible one. Other ones are the drop, uh, the, the end of the Atlantic conveyor, the, the, what amounts to the uh, Gulf Stream uh, that would result from lots of fresh water coming off of the glaciers of Greenland that might lead to changes in the salinity. So there's a number of different mechanisms by which the world could change rather dramatically. And I think, the, I think one of the great virtues of the book is it doesn't present the conventional view of a kind of gradually warming world, but abrupt shifts that are extremely difficult challenge. You, you made a choice to put it that way. Why? Well, two things. And one of them is just that it is very hard to dramatize and write novels about something that will creep up on us over a period of a couple hundred years. That's simply a hard story to tell. So you want, you look for the abrupt events. Uh, and this has been a problem facing me ever since I first talked to climate scientists about it, where I asked how fast West Antarctic ice sheet come, could come off, and uh, Donald Blankship, University of Texas, goes, really fast. And I said, how fast? And he goes, uh, 500 years. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, he, climatologist, he's a, he's that's a, a long time. He's a geologist. So um, then you needed, I needed to find things faster than that. Well, there was Richard Alley, and it was 2002. Abrupt climate change is not even a term until 2002. The, green, the book called Abrupt Climate Change. Yeah, and a report for the National Research Council. Um, the Greenland ice core data 
showed this 8,200 year event, uh, ago event, or even the Younger Dryas itself, where you go in three years, you go from a, a world climate that is um, warm and wet to cool and dry in a three year period. And the ice data are quite convincing on that. So then you look and you go, well, holy shit, uh, that's abrupt. And they didn't have a word for it because these are people who thought 500 years was abrupt before. So that's why this term abrupt climate change in a new report, and essentially they had been Peter crying wolf. You know, things are going to happen fast. It'll be within 2,000 years. And then they suddenly find things happening in three years. And that's what I wrote up in the book that's over there called Green Earth. Uh, uh, so, okay, it's obvious that you need dramatic reasons. You want, uh, the faster the crisis, the easier it is to dramatize in a novel. But then also, it's responding to reality itself. These are the news stories coming in. If we manage to release methane that it's caught in the permafrost in the Arctic, if the, Arctic, if the Arctic Ocean doesn't have any ice whatsoever and the sun goes down in there and heats that Arctic Ocean really, really fast you know, um, and we lose albedo, I mean, there are, there are some tipping points, as they called them, and that's not a bad way to think of it. And those are the ones that the writer seizes. And, you know, in fact, Stuart and I also were involved in another study on abrupt change about the ice-free Arctic. And one of the things you find there in terms of the politics of it, which are particularly vexed, of course, there's one country that actually gains from climate change. Well, yeah, all the Arctic countries. Well, particularly Russia. Russia is a big... Ah, it's a go. plot. They're They've back. hacked us. Yes, yes. The Russians, yeah, they, they, you know, they like climate change. Why? Think Siberia, nice warm climate as a result. Think the Northern Passage. Uh, and suddenly you've got... Uh, uh, an opportunity. They think of that as the Great Sea Road, they call it. Uh, so, you know, from their point of view, climate change is a good thing. They well, have one of the worst climates on the planet. They like to see climate change. Yeah, but they're not going to like it when the permafrost melts because that's I, the taiga, that. that's the... I mean, a whole lot of Russia is in such a position that when that turns into a swamp all the time, and they use their frozen rivers for roads, and they don't have those frozen rivers, they don't have roads. Russia will have as, about as much trouble as anyone else, and Russian scientists will tell the government that. So I don't think, um, I, you know what, they sign, they're creating so much less carbon than we are, uh, and partly because their economy crashed. Uh, but um, yeah, each one of these tipping points has a different scenario that, or multiple scenarios, and that's one of the, one of the problems is that it's a, a garden of forking paths, that at every fork in the path you have five or six different stories that could eventuate from that particular, and then it goes on and it goes on, and this is why you get science fiction. Well, but I, I, look, I, I think this is very useful, science fiction in that respect. The science of the science fiction is very important. Uh, I had the privilege of representing Salesforce in the climate talks last year in Paris, and I, I think, I wish I'd had this book around then, because of course they were all talking about gradual climate change. And, and I actually think that the abrupt change is a much more probable scenario, that the models don't actually really work for gradual change, that the uh, unevenness of the Earth in all its different ways will generate fairly abrupt change. And so I think your model is actually a much more perceptive one. The thing that was very difficult to put on the agenda in uh, uh, Paris was geoengineering, right? Nobody wanted to talk about geoengineering because everybody was afraid that would take the uh, adaptation and mitigation off the map. Right. So right. now, you've just raised the issue of geoengineering. We just had a major report come out on geoengineering literally just a few weeks ago. Is there a scenario in your mind by which we could actually get to that kind of, you know, you think about the politics of any country or any group of countries in a serious way trying to modify the atmosphere, change the albedo, uh, do things like putting iron filings in the ocean, all the different kinds of ways in which we've talked about it. I is there a scenario for actually getting from here to there? Not a good one. It would make a great novel to try to tell it because no one will like this plan. Even the scientists that are studying the various geoengineering proposals that are being made, and there's you know a half a dozen to a dozen of right. them uh, working on this right now, um, they don't like it, and, they, and they're under uh, attack constantly for it by various kinds of environmentalists that think it's a hubris, and it also creates a moral hazard. Um, if we think we can geoengineer our way out of it, then maybe we don't have to stop burning carbon as fast as we'd otherwise. Exactly. As a moral hazard, this is a problem, but what these scientists are saying is, if we get into a situation where we really want some mitigation fast, like a sudden giant plume of methane, uh, where we look like we're going to get a 10 degree centigrade raise 
in 20 years, we might do anything for a while, including this main one. The main proposal is, and I'm sure you know this, the volcanic eruption imitation. Pump a bunch of sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere, it falls back down to the ground. So after about five years, your, your experiment is over and you can't permanently thrash the world and create snow piercer. Or, we're not that powerful. So you can try experiments with, without maybe wrecking things, but you have that moral hazard of, oh, wait a second, in our back pocket, we have magical cures. And none of them are good enough. None of them are great silver bullets. If you were to do the sulfur dioxide, if you were to uh, increase the albedo and bounce some light away, 2% less albedo and do like uh, Pintanubo did, you still have ocean acidification happening from our, our, our carbon burn. Most, well, half of the CO2 or a third to a half of the CO2 we put in the atmosphere ends up in the ocean. The ocean is measurably different than it was when we first started measuring it on a pH scale. As it gets more acidic, the stuff at the bottom of the food chain in the ocean might get killed. We don't know. But it's, they're made of calcium carbonate, a lot of them, in terms of their mini shells. So it sounds bad to have a more acidic environment for them. Well, uh, are you really going to try that? And then uh, it's going to be a vexed topic. I actually think this pumping of seawater to the top of Antarctica is one of the least um, dangerous sounding ideas of I all. I agree. And it's peculiar because that doesn't solve um, increasing temperatures, drought, uh, extinctions, all the other stuff. There, and also geoengineering is probably the wrong word because engineering again implies that we know what we're doing. So it should be geofinessing or geobegging. Geobegging. Geo geo we're begging Gaia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if we kiss your toe, will you not kick us? <laughs> this is how it should be regarded. And so calling it geoengineering is already one political strike against us. It sounds like, like a term like, say, population control. Well, this is a term you should never use in the world. Is, is that people immediately think, wait, what kind of fascist horrific stuff is this? Because of the name. And geoengineering has an immediate bad ring to it. But even if we get serious about it, we've got terrible trouble. So I, I want to talk not just about this book, but your books. Because I, I like, like many others, I've read many of your books. Not them all, but many. And, and it, uh, Stuart and I were involved with uh, another organization 30 years ago called the Santa Fe Institute, which was oh, about yeah. studying complexity. And complexity seems to be an underlying theme through most of your, not, or many, I won't say most, but the ones I've read. Uh, for example, the recent one prior to this was a book called Aurora about a starship. And things don't go so well. The mm. ecosystems don't ultimately function particularly well. The pol political systems begin to break down the social system, the economic systems. All these things that depend upon complex organic functions, self-organizing from the bottom up, as opposed to human beings figuring them out and making them work. You seem to have a deep suspicion of our ability to understand and manage complexity. Ooh, well, <laughs> we, 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 we do pretty well in some ways, and then it's too complex to do really well. I, you know, I, I'm an English major and I write novels. And the reason I write science fiction novels is because I think those make the best novels today, because we're in a science fiction novel, and so it's the best realism. <laughs> and so I... Right on. That was good. That's a yeah. keeper. We're yeah. all in a science fiction novel. Well, like we that. are. And we're co-authoring it together, and it's, it's, a, it's a wild one. It, in fact, it's getting weirder and weirder yes. Yes. every year, which is kind of beautiful and kind of terrifying. Hunter Thompson did have it right, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> I, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that I, when you try to write a novel, the, the cool thing about science fiction is not only is it the best realism of our time, but it also goes beyond the, the domestic realist novel of the mid-20th century, a kind of imitation high modernism, would say that it's always about individuals, it's all about characters, and it has to be stuff that people would really do, like on a college campus or on an adventure somewhere. This version of, of um, the novel was individual and, and individual. Story of a divorce, story of a person with Tourette syndrome, on and on it goes. Well, the 19th century novel was about individual and individual and individual and society, uh, history. And that's why the big 19th century novels still appeal to us, and that's what this... Uh, uh, imitation modernism lost. And so science fiction not only gets us back to individual, individual, individual society, individual and in history, but also individual and planet. 
And this is something that's maybe a little bit new to literature, that, that the novel would also include the relationship between people, history, and planet, uh, civilization and planet, and civilization as an ecological uh, balancing act. So this is good. This is, it makes for new novels. It makes for big novels uh, and long novels. <laughs> uh, and so complexity comes into it just as part of the novel becoming um, back, going back to its 19th century um, uh, sense of scale. The, the, and, and so I love that part of what science fiction gives me. And you've done something else with this novel. This is where I'll wrap up and then we'll throw it open for, for questions. Uh, I, I, each of your books has some elements of style that vary and so on. And one of the things I loved about this one was that uh, at, at the beginning of each chapter, you have, you, you, this is a very literate book, I have to sell, tell you. you, you you're going to be uh, checking your uh, uh, Wikipedia fairly often for authors, ideas, etc. It's a wonderfully literate book. And before each chapter, you have quotes, mostly, and a few what amount to poems that you wrote as part of it. But just to read two quick quotes, one that I particularly loved later in the book. In a storm, the flat iron appeared to be moving toward me like the bow of a monster ocean steamer, a picture of new America still in the making, said Alfred Steiglitz about the flat iron building in New York. And you can just uh, love that image. Mm -hmm. And just before the thing you read to us about the mechanism, you go on a long, wonderful rap that you could be straight out of uh, 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 Allen Ginsberg. Drowned, hosed, visiting Davy Jones, six fathoms under, wet, all wet, moldy, mildewed, tidal, marshy, splashing, surfing, body surfing, diving, drinking, in the drink, drunk, damp, scuba, plunged, high diving, slosh, drunk, doubt, and it goes on. Uh, but wonderfully poetic moments in here. Uh, you, you went in a different way stylistically. You have eight different voices in here, different characters, including the citizen which you read from. Uh, talk a little bit about how you approach this book that's very different from your others. Well, it's a, it, it was a beautiful thing. I, I wanted to write about global finance, as I talked about last year. And I told my editor that, and he said, that's a terrible idea, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, but I want to. And then he said, uh, well, could you put it in that drowned New York that you visited for 10 pages in, in 2312, an earlier novel of mine? And I thought, well, that's a good idea. And then he said, you know, if you're going to put it in New York, you need a whole st range of characters. Why don't you do like those French apartment novels where all the characters live in the same building. They don't necessarily know each other at the beginning, but later I'm going, shut up, Tim. I mean, that's enough. I, I, I'll, go, I'll take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great idea. And, and so I did a building novel, and I picked the, the old Metropolitan Life Tower, which is the original one, right next to the Flatiron, and it's built as an imitation of the Campanile in, in Venice. So I have a Venetian building already, although it's maybe 10 times taller. And so I chose that building, I put my characters in it, and then it being a New York story, at a certain point, uh, the, the stories about New York, the little epigraphs, you know, uh, remember George Eliot in Middlemarch, every chapter has an epigraph, and that, that's a, it's like too many. So I decided to double down, and I have four or five epigraphs for every chapter. I just, I threw in every single New York story that struck, struck me as worth telling, so that they're, that's one of the reasons why it's so, so fat. Um, the couple that I like the most, and some of them are my own lines. The invisible hand never picks up the check. This is um, the only lie to mine that's on the internet as a kind of meme that doesn't come from me. And uh, there's a market for markets. That's Donald McKenzie of the Financial Times. Um, there's a story about Thomas Edison filming the electrocution of an elephant on Coney Island as an entertainment event. 1,500 people gather to see an elephant get electrocuted. Um, uh, something like, you know, Edison was big on lots of volts or watts anyway. It was something like 6,600 volts put through this elephant. So they kind of cooked it. And it was a, and it was a, you know, an entertainment event. And then next year, three elephants disappeared from the Coney Island Zoo. Whoa, they're gone. And then one of them they found over on Staten Island. You're thinking, elephants swam across New York Bay about three miles um, in order, and, and, the, and then the other two were never found again, and I was imagining them like yetis, you know, they're, they're living in Long Island, <laughs> nobody ever sees them again, but then my wife has uh, started as an animal behavior since she explained to me 
that elephants tend to hang together. So probably they all headed for Staten Island and two of them drown on the trip. So these are the kind of bizarre and yet they really happen type New York stories that you can't do without if you're going to do a New York novel. So yeah, I had fun with it. And after Aurora, I needed fun. <laughs> so. Yeah, Aurora's pretty grim. Very grim. Yes. No, but they're, they're quite wonderful and wonderfully literate. And, and, and I have to say, you know, I'm a speed reader. I used to teach speed reading. I couldn't speed read this. It was, it grabbed, <laughs> I tried, and it just kept grabbing me, both the, the writing, the ideas, and so on. So I, I just had to read every word, uh, and it was delicious. All right, now let's open it up for questions, oh, comments yeah. from mm -hmm. the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael will hand you the mic. That's uh, right. Uh, Rio's got a mic, and I've got a mic. And just a quick shout out to the folks that are listening. We've got a bunch of Long Now members listening online. You guys uh, can send in your questions as well. Um, but uh, who's got a question? Just raise your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. There we go. Start off. Anyone over here? This could be an entirely bad idea, but I'm thinking that if I wanted to carry water up a hill, say a mountain in Antarctica. I'd probably rather carry balloons full of steam than buckets full of water. Interesting idea. Oh, yeah, well. We got one more plan. All right. The balloons full of steam. Right. Yeah. I, I'm wondering about the physics of that. Is, is steam probably weighs the same as the water that it constituted. But whatever. Do we need better ideas than the ones that we've got? I was thinking everybody could carry one backpack of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the adventure travel needs some point, right? Over here. Over here. Hey, uh, thank you so much. I was curious if you looked at, in, in kind of contradistinction to the geoengineering, a lot of the proposals that are happening with regards to the restoration of ecosystems to use biology to really deal with a lot of the things that technology isn't dealing with. Some of the things that... For instance, Paul Hawkins has been putting together in his new book, Drawdown, and I was wondering if you had a chance to kind of review any of the proposals around how we kind of have, we've been thinking about climate change in an inverted kind of way, where we blame CO2, but it's actually the disruption of the ecosystems and the capacity to stabilize a lot of the cycles of water and carbon that are really the, the issues. Yeah. Do you know about Drawdown? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that they both are, uh, one thing, it's not just, destructions of the ecological systems are a disaster and are part of the um, catastrophe that we're in, the long emergency that we're in. Um, but also burning of fossil carbon, we're not necessarily going to happen unless we did it. So these are two different problems and stopping burning fossil carbon would be one thing to do. Restoring ecological systems would be another and drawing carbon down. You grow forests, you grow peat beds, you uh, burn charcoal and bury it. There are ways of drawing carbon down, and a lot of talk now of if you could pull CO2 to the atmosphere with your... If every windmill creating electricity was using a tenth of that electricity to uh, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere through chemical means, you might have then a whole lot more dry ice than we need. You'd have to bury that. That's bad news, but you could use the carbon in carbon dioxide to make graphene and then you could use graphene to replace cement, and cement is a huge creator of carbon burn. So that there are some circular loops to carbon drawdown. And really, the tech is not the problem. This is why last year's talk was about economics rather than tech, because we've got clean techs. We just can't afford to pay ourselves to put them in place fast enough because we're trying to make a profit on everything. And so this, the economic system that we're in, if you take the IPAT formula, our impact equals population times appetite times technology. The real dangerous one, and I said this to Paul Ehrlich, that it's not appetite, although you could call it that. It's the economic system that you're in. It's really the, the capitalist system of profit and shareholder value as the only two values that are killing us. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you mentioned Drawdown. For those of you who don't know, an excellent book just came out called Drawdown by Paul, Tom Steyer, and a number of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes one fundamental point. And you know, having been in Paris, all we talked about was taking CO2 from a growth rate like this to a growth rate like that, as opposed to what we actually have to do, which is to go like that. Yeah. That is actually lower the levels of CO2, reduce the CO2. Right now, all we're talking about is slowing the rate of growth of CO2. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, Paris got us halfway to what we need, which was an immense historical achievement, but then we need more than that. That's why I like the name of um, 350.org, because yes. that's aspirational and it's a science fiction story. 
and we're heading toward it's, 500 at the moment. It's a kind of a geoengineering story yes. by the, in the name of that organization. We have time for one or two more questions. One back here. I want to look a whole lot farther. Here? A yeah. whole lot farther in the future. Uh, okay, it's all happened. All these bad things happen. But then they figure out a solution in the future, like 500 years from now. And they say, okay, we're going to put Greenland back the way it's supposed to be. And the 50 million people in Greenland say, what? What do you mean supposed to be? <laughs> what, what's, what you have now is normal for the average person. What will happen 100 years from now will also be normal for the average person, right? Yes. I mean, we'll say all well, these horrible changes are happening, but then horrible changes happen all the time. Well, people starve, people you know, have wars. Yes, um, I take your point, and I, that's one of the things I'm doing in New York 2140. Young people in the super Venice that is around lower Manhattan are going to be trying to have fun and trying to get by. And Greenland, the ice on Greenland is a is an artifact of the ice age. It just is 10,000 years slow to melt relative to everywhere else. And if it were to melt, it would be a really interesting place. And we are going to be on a mongrel planet from now on, and we are going to be adapting to the weirdnesses that we ourselves have created. That's what it means to be in the Anthropocene, which is a real thing and worth discussing. However, um, we're facing a mass extinction event that could cause, I mean, the fact we got 8 billion people on this planet is, a, is, a, is an artificial creation of a civilization itself. And carrying capacity of this planet is unknown. Um, but what we don't want is a mass extinction event that we lose all our fellow mammals and we lose, well, I don't know, a billion or two people. That would be bad, okay? That would be like um, World War II and World War I. And, and when you can see it coming in advance and you actually know the story of the, of 1900 to 1914, when you see a disaster bearing down on you, what you would want to say to future generations is, well, we saw it coming and we dodged it. So we got to avoid extinctions and we got to avoid mass deaths. And other than that, it's a marginal planet. And, and we're always going to be dealing with mixed new ecologies that we've made ourselves. So that's fine as long as we uh, share it with the rest of the animals. And actually making these mongrel, bastardized ecologies that we're going to have to make is going to be what saves us in the end from the, the mass death scenario. So I want to make a distinction between, you know, oh, because this is a deep ecology view. You know what, if only three or four billion people would die, we'd be better off, the earth would be better off. That's not a good message. It's no. not a good message. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to say before we get our next question, I uh, just want to remind everybody, Stan is going to be sticking around. So if you're here and you don't have a chance to ask your question, Stan's sticking around. He's going to sign books. He's going to talk uh, to, to the rest of us and make the salon part of this series uh, really happen. So please uh, stick around. And also just a shout out to Borderlands Books, who have a lot more of Stan's books here. So make sure to do it. Everyone out there, wherever you're listening. Everybody, it's buying books that get this kind of thought done. That's right. <laughs> and and suppo support your indie local sci-fi bookstore, everybody. Yeah. So here's our next question. And last question. Uh, so hopefully this question is not too much of a long, uh, non sequitur, but you've just sort of walked into it. Um, the, so we've been talking a lot about technologies and things, but I wonder in writing your books and thinking about this, what do you think are the human qualities or society qualities that... Um, either are most important or under, that would need to be encouraged or that you would pick three if you had to, kind of. What do you think are the important human qualities or societal qualities that we could focus on developing as we go into this age? Oh, my Lord. Uh, as a novelist, I would just say, you know, it's, uh, uh, each person is completely different, and so this is hard. So I would, uh, would want to um, shift that into a political mode and just say um, anything uh, to the left, anything progressive. Uh, first anti-austerity, then Keynesianism, then social democracy, then post-capitalism. Uh, so you, you've got to fight the present battle, which is, um, you can call it anti-austerity, you can call it anti-Trump. Uh, anything, well, the, the central wing, in America it means uh, reforming the Democratic Party and shifting it to the left in an effective way that appeals to everybody and, and wins the electoral college elections. So there's that first step, and then you get into an agreement that Keynesianism is really a description of reality as such, 
and, and you support both government and business in a teeter-totter where they both are healthy. And then you go to social democracy, like in Scandinavia, where you've got a social safety net and you've got full employment and you've got free education, that these are the pushes that are pretty damned obvious. And so um, uh, if you can tell that story and make them sound as obvious as they seem uh, to me, and, to, and this is a kind of a San Francisco thing, you know. There are two California ideologies. A lot of people in Europe, when they say the California ideology, I'm going, yeah, right on, that's us, that's me. And what they mean is the libertarian Silicon Valley, silver bullet, we can cure this with better coding, blah, blah, blah. And that's what they mean by the California ideology, whereas I want to point to San Francisco's social life, its progressivism, and the kind of left-wing politics that is dragging America you know, to the left, to the extent that it is. So there's even a battle over what does it mean by the word, you know, what, is, what does the term California ideology mean? But as a, you know, patriotic Californian, and I just love what's happened here in the last, I don't know, 100 years or so, um, because it started as an accident and as a gold rush. And as Thoreau pointed out, these are desperate people, um, misguided, deluded, and desperate people who came out here in search of gold. And so, you know, we still have that tradition in Silicon Valley, and we said that tradition in Hollywood. Between the gold rush, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and the Sierra Nevada, and the coastline, and this bay, we've got a, we've got a problem. It's, the place is too beautiful, it's too charismatic, it's too populated, and it's, the, the pressures are enormous, and yet we still have made this unstable but good place. Multicultural, 100 languages spoken, um, a mixed uh, cultures, races, ethnicities, etc., that have all come here, and so there's only a few Native Americans left, and they're doing okay, some of them, because of the casino system. The whole system here has conspired by accident, by an accident of history, to make something quite bizarre. And, and uh, it's like you're, we're on a tightrope of some sort, uh, and, and we could be leading the way in, in these ways. So we've got to uh, think not the California ideology that is the technical fix and the computer fix and libertarianism. We've got to think the California ideology that is progressive movement, the New Deal, the, uh, the multicultural uh, and all-inclusive diversity uh, of uh, San Francisco. So it's kind of weird because Silicon Valley and San Francisco, A, they're two parts of an integrated, they're like two Hindu gods fighting each other. And they're only about 100 miles apart or 80 miles apart. And yet they represent divergent views of how to go forward. And maybe you can collapse them together. I mean, that's kind of what some of the people here are all about. But it's, um, well, we're in a good spot to make an interesting impact on the whole situation. So Stan with that, let's go impact. Stan. So So something we do at Long Now is we have these challenge medals, which we learned from the national security community. You are part of our security for the oh future. God. It says Carpe Millennium. He truly seizes the millennium. We give these for people with big vision, big heart, and big impact. Well, thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Yay. Beautiful.